Hello and welcome to the event you've all been waiting for, the Virtual Vision Finance Leaders Roundtable and insights for a new era. I'm Ben Myers, Head of News at Finance Magnets and I shall be your moderator for today's session. It is my honour and privilege to introduce my panel, panel members, five absolute titans of the industry who need no introduction, but I'll give them anyway. anyway. Mm. Number one, we've got Andrew Raylich, founder and CEO of One Zero. Andrew. We've got Brendan Callan, CEO of FXCM. We've got Duncan Anderson, CEO of Ticknell Group UK. Hello. Harpal Sandhu, CEO of Integral. And Mark Levin, CEO of the CFH Group. Good afternoon, all. Hey, hey Ben. Thank you very much. Before we go diving in, I just want to say that we'd love to hear from you, the audience, during today's presentation. So please leave your comments next to the video and feel free to ask any questions within reasonable legal boundaries. Uh, we'll be answering questions at the end of the session. And if we don't get to answer your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. So without any further ado, let's go jumping in there. Gentlemen, it will be impossible to talk uh, with you all without mentioning Corona and the Q1 that uh, Corona brought on. So which factor was the most dominant in determining winners and losers during this period? And we'll start with Duncan, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, winners, losers. Uh... I think um, it's it's incredible that uh, we've been able to adapt so quickly uh, to this pandemic. So from a winning point of view, any firm that has solid infrastructure, uh, the ability to adapt quickly will have found themselves in a successful position. When you say solid infrastructure, I mean, how prepared were you? I'm guessing there was some, uh, some work from home, some operational changes uh, to that. How prepared were you for those structural changes? Well, the way that we sort of built the business, I mean, and, and most online businesses uh, uh, that exist in this sort of uh, uh, scope are, are, I guess, fundamentally built to adapt. So within 24 hours, we were actually able to have a fully serviced operation uh, with everyone working from home. So from a client perspective, it was, it was pretty seamless actually. Uh, and from, our, from our, our perspective as well, we really had very little, uh, you know, snagging issues uh, from the word go. So all I can say is that actually was business as usual. And I think that just comes down to the preparedness that we, we have generally and deep infrastructure all round for the business. Okay, and is it a similar story with the other guys, Mark? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I guess back to your uh, uh, original question uh, about winners and losers. Um, I think it all started actually all the way back in, uh, in January uh, with our offices out in Hong Kong and Singapore being impacted and then that escalated in, uh, in February, March into Europe. Um, so it's actually been pretty much since the beginning of the year we've been in this situation um, and luckily, as, as Duncan said, we are an IT business, we're a digital business. So uh, one of the few fortunate uh, companies and industries uh, that have uh, that have been able to navigate and mitigate the, a big impact on the business. Um, so, um, and uh, I mean, CFH is a, is, a, is an IT company uh, at, a, at a core level. So. Uh, Working from home, having all that set up was uh, was already in place uh, way before Corona. Uh, not that we ever foresaw Corona, but uh, but it was all in place beforehand. Same question, Brendan. Yeah, I'd reiterate the same. I think work from home capabilities really was a difference maker um, across different firms. I think our industry in particular seems to have held up pretty well. I think our the fact that we're all online businesses by nature helped. Mm. But there, there's a difference between firms that do BCDR tests to tick a box and those that do it to make sure they can provide a seamless experience for their customers during times like this. And some of the smaller kind of niggly issues you don't find out until you really do it genuinely. If, yeah. You know, your, your online banking has IP restrictions and 
you don't find that out until you're pressed hard. It's uh, it can it can put you in a bind for a couple of days because getting around that during a pandemic can take days. So if those aren't little issues that you sorted out long in advance, it can bring your company to a halt pretty quickly. And from an operational point of view, S same. So so uh, Duncan and I are the two that. If I'm wrong here, I apologize. The two that face retail clients. So we've got uh, hundreds of thousands of clients dialing into us from all over the world, speaking you know dozens of languages. Mm -hmm. um, so our struggle has been, like he was referring to, just making sure that we offer a seamless customer experience. I'm not sledding the others by any means. Don't don't take this wrong. But uh, that that was our biggest, uh, obviously, focus point. And, and FXM did really well. We were, in fact, about to start a marketing campaign that our whole time's not never really got above 40 seconds. And um, we held 90% positive kind of thumbs up ratings on exit surveys throughout. So I'm proud of our team. I'm proud of how the FXCM services held up. And uh, yeah, we're, we're business as usual. And we're not, because of that, we're not pushing the agenda to get people back into the office. You know, we may come to this, but uh, we're very comfortable with the remote working and work from home now. And you know, it's lessons we'll carry forward. Yeah, we we'll definitely speak about the working from home thing, but also before that, um, Andrew, your input on the say what happened in terms of Q1 and Corona. Yeah, I, I think you know a lot of the points have been made. Uh, what we've emphasized and really seen here is that our industry has done very well. So less about being a SaaS company or an IT-driven organization, uh, which is a necessity in our space. I think one of the challenges that we're all up against and, and is a, a core foundational aspect to operating in this industry is the 24-hour nature of the FX business. And that, that is a, a principle that defines in many ways how we need to structure our support organizations, our technology infrastructure. And you know we find ourselves on the technology side often asking, why didn't I make restaurant software where I could you know, clock in at nine and leave at five? But the, the underpinnings of that means, you know, at one zero, a, a principle has always been providing round the clock support to our clients in operational centers where people know how to respond and know how to solve an issue if a client has an issue 24 hours a day. And that means we've been staffing and, and engaging remotely with our different desks in the US, Europe and Australia, as well as Asia. For, for years in the business. So okay. Zoom, Slack, coordinating uh, uh, across different regional boundaries. These are all natural ingrained principles in our business and I imagine anybody operating in this space. So we were able to transition quite easily into a remote environment because uh, by nature we were already split globally and distributed in a way that and we've already solved that challenge. And, and I think on the flip side, operationally, the other half of your question, I. I Personally, I'm very proud of how our infrastructure and tech held up through March, and, and I'm sure our, our, our clients appreciate the same. Very much so in this industry, we've been um, promoting the commoditization and, and, and push towards outsourcing of core critical components of trading and risk infrastructure, and those companies who were relying on 1.0 through this period certainly saw the benefit of that. And Harper? You know, I think uh, a lot of the folks have touched on uh, the resiliency aspect. And I think, uh, I mean, we were all online businesses coming into this. So the initial shift of merely the issue of not coming into an office and alternatively working out of our homes uh, was, was kind of a non-issue. Uh, and I don't think that's where, um, you know, we, we really saw Integral's infrastructure, not just in terms of a people and process standpoint, but from a business model standpoint, really kind of um, uh, show off in a way. Um, so just FYI, just giving you a little bit of background. I mean, Integral not only runs our own systems on a global basis, you know, supporting three data centers around the world and, uh, and so on. We actually run the infrastructure for roughly 180 banks and brokers around the world. So in our, in our case, more than half our business is actually coming from the banking market. So this is actually regular retail, uh, commercial corporate banking infrastructure uh, around the world. So <clears throat> where I thought you know, things got really interesting was not just the initial phase of people being forced to work from home and continue to support their clients and, their, and in our case, our clients' clients, 
Mm -hmm. um, but as the epidemic sort of, or the pandemic sort of moved through its various phases and put strains not only in the physical location of people, but on the access uh, to credit and liquidity in the markets, uh, that's when it became really interesting. And, and we're not going through the obvious of, you know, the high volatility that was in March and the widening spreads and people's, you know, risk management regime changes that they may have gone through of maybe internalizing more flow in some cases, in other cases, hedging more flow because of the risks uh, associated with the volatility. But I get, I'll tell you a very interesting point was literally uh, two weeks ago uh, when the Turkish lira uh, volatility uh, and the political ramifications of potentially, you know, the market devaluing the Turkish lira led to the Turkish government um, banning um, uh, bilateral trading with a certain number of international institutions. <clears throat> Those retail brokers in Turkey still needed to support their customers sure. in terms of providing access for risk transference uh, in in all of those <clears throat> all of those uh, currency pairs, Integral's network being this sort of OTC ECN where we can connect all of these various parties together allowed for and I kid you not within 24 hours a complete rewiring of liquidity access to probably 40 percent of the Turkish volume, uh, the global Turkish volume. Mm -hmm. uh, we were we were the second largest marketplace in the world for gold in March. Uh, so really unusual times. And I think uh, it's pretty interesting uh, how, how resilient the market was through all of this. So whilst I've still got your hands up, I like it. Yep. We're almost at a lockdown as though it seems to be easing globally, where we seem as though, you know, to, to, to touch where we seem to be coming out of uh, the pandemic, or certainly flattening the curve. Looking back now, what lessons have you personally learned uh, from this situation? Having options, having options, uh, both for us and more importantly for our customers who are serving their customers. So what do I mean by, by, by having options? A, uh, you need to have incredibly flexible underlying IT infrastructure. So the example that I just talked about, completely rerouting liquidity com to completely uh, brand new sources. So without a hiccup, you're continuing to serve your customers. Uh, shifting to alternative data centers. Um, uh, shifting to uh, uh, different cost structures, uh, being able to deal with one month where you have extremely high volumes and you may want to be hedging that, uh, that flow uh, to another month where the volumes have come down and you may want to be b-booking that flow if the volatility has also come down. But basically the point is all of our customers who are the large brokers around the world run very complex businesses and they have a number of dials. They have a dial related to their volumes. They have a dial related to their risk management. They have a dial related to their IT. They have a dial re related to you know, customer service and the volume of inbound uh, calls they're getting and supporting them. The greater flexibility they have to turn those dials any which way they would like based on their priorities of how they want to serve their customers to the best, uh, the best that they can, uh, the, the, the greater flexibility they have uh, the more uh, resilient they are. And that's what really leads to the high service level. Well, I mean, we're quite proud of the fact that we're essentially their, their technology partner in this. It's their business, it's their front end, it's their brand, but we stand behind them to allow them to do whatever they want with a great deal of flexibility. And we have seen them, I kid you not, they are completely different businesses from February to March and then back to April and May. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, we publish the news. We publish the news. We publish the. Uh, we have gone through the full cycle uh, with you guys, and so same question to other people as well. Duncan, like, uh, have there been any lessons that you particularly have learned? I think uh, yeah, it's adaptability. Um, we need to ensure that going forward. Uh, we can ad adapt in the same way that actually we, we came across this process uh, with this, this, uh, this um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, so I would really strongly look internally from our side to, to ensure that we can adapt on the front foot and 
and and ensure that actually we can we can we can process the the types of uh, flows that we're we're going to see, and it, it it's going to be different flow. I think from a from a broker point of view, um, we are looking at uh, probably liquidity issues going forward. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be major sort of jump points, and I think again it comes back to technology, and if we can ensure smooth running, smooth prices. Um, and communication with our clients, we will be able to uh, adapt as fast as we need to be able to. And so, were there were there procedural errors, or like was it just a case of it caught you off guard, or in terms of? No, I said, uh, as I said before, I mean, from from a structural point of view, uh, we were you know we're absolutely satisfied from 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 Tipmill's point of view that you know mm -hmm. like I said we were up and running within twenty four hours uh, from a. From a from a standstill, uh, from a home base, we uh, I, I just I just feel that going forward now, we just need to ensure that whatever lessons we have learned, which which again comes back to adaptability, um, that we continue to push forward because there are going to be bumpy roads ahead. That's for sure. <laughs> and Brendan, similar story. Any lessons learned? Yeah, well, on a personal level, my wife and I had our second child in the middle of this pandemic. So, uh, Congratulations! Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm relearning the importance of a good night's sleep, I'll say that. <laughs> and, and I'm learning that Zoom's not too forgiving with bags under your eyes, but hey. Tell me about it. Luckily, I don't have to go through any airport security. They'll charge me double for these. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I would reiterate what some of the others have said. Like I said, quite a lot of firms do BCDR testing as a tick box exercise, and I think those that did learned a hard lesson here. And unfortunately, their clients probably as well. Uh, so keeping that a constant focus going forward. And in internal communication, I've found as important as anything else. You know, during times like this, we've all got staff all over the world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have staff in Asia as well. This hit them first and, and hardest in the beginning. Uh, so trying to stay on top of what to be communicating to each of these regional offices and very important people to your organization is, is certainly a lesson learned and, and something we'll carry forward as well. So with the say global, you've got global offices, got staff in different time zones, got staff in different regulations. How does one basically centralize that when you've got different governments issuing different guidelines on work, etc.? You don't centralize it. I guess that's the, uh, uh, that was at least our view. Uh, we had to take into account the local situation in each country and what the yeah. local government said and recommended of how to conduct business uh, and very much led it to uh, the local managers to actually decide how to respond uh, to the situation. Uh, it's no good someone sitting at the top saying this is uh, dictating how it should be done because the situations have been very, very different from country to country and also yeah. how the countries they reacted to it, right? Uh, I guess uh, I'm sitting in Denmark, I'm back in the office now. We did an early lockdown, our neighbors uh, just over the, over the bridge in Sweden, they didn't do. Uh, they still have a lot of cases going on, right? So even similar countries that normally do things the same way have responded completely differently. Um, and I guess that's, the, that's also the key here. Decentralizing some of that decision-making has been key on our side. Okay, that makes sense. So especially when they say there's so many different countries involved, different regulation, different guidelines, it's uh, exactly. you have to take the lead on it, surely. And what about, say, Andrew, any lessons uh, learned for yourself there? Yeah, so, I mean... There's two sides of the coin from our perspective. There's looking at this incident and event from the perspective of, of our industry and, and, and what that affected and, and our, the technological and, and innovation ramifications from that. And there's kind of the, the, the more meta level business concept of, you know, how are we operating our business? How are we evolving as business leaders during a, a very unprecedented period? And, and Mark made a great point, you know, one of the natural tendencies of a globally distributed business is to attempt to the best of your ability to umbrella decision making, try yeah. to make th certain things consistent. We've strived at one zero to, to permeate the, the culture, um, you know, the, the atmosphere that, that we develop and, and enrich within the organization globally. But we sat down as a leadership team last week and said, if we take the government level restrictions and mandates that are happening here in the US, and attempt to apply them in Sydney um, or, or, or Singapore, two, two different sides of, of 
the equation, it's not going to fit. So we've made the decision to take very regional focused organizational type decision making in, in terms of how we come back to the office. Now, where we have taken an umbrella approach organizationally is in, in really reinforcing and, and using the word defining quite often in our communications, both internally and externally. This is a unique time, a challenging time, an opportunistic time, but, but most so defining in terms of how we treat our employees, how we treat our partners and vendors during these times. You know, we're, we're all gonna get credit. There, there's a, all great businesses represented on this panel today. No doubt we all did well as a result of volatility, which drives our market in, 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 in the course of March. We're all gonna get some credit for that, but really where our businesses are gonna be judged and, and really examined retroactively is how do we treat our people during this? How did we evolve as leaders in, in helping our organization work through this and without disrupting culture or, or client activity? And, and also, how did we treat our vendors? So that's something that I've continued to reiterate across a, a few different discussions here is, is we're taking the position that there's certainly areas of optimization, but every business is struggling in different ways with this. And we're looking at our partners, be it our, from our landlord to our, to our um, partners in, in conference and, and, and venue accommodation like finance magnates. And, finding creative ways to support and make sure that their businesses work through uh, these challenging times. Definitely challenging times, but it's a, we're at a different stage now than we were two months ago, certainly reporting from finance magnets uh, falling volumes. We can now start to look towards, uh, hopefully, a, a post-COVID-19 landscape. What's next? Andrew, while you're here, yeah. <laughs> you first. Perfect transition, because I did mention there's two sides of the coin, and, and it, I would be doing an injustice if I didn't talk a little bit about how technology and innovation is, is driving both into and out of this uh, you know, new market paradigm that we're in. So uh, two concepts that I think are really important from a technology perspective that, that came to light significantly over the course of February, March, and April. Um, one of those is data-driven decision-making. We, we've been massively investing within our organization over the past three or four years in centralizing, building time series, building derivative analytics for our clients about their business. And, and one of those defining aspects of, of working through a challenging period like this is understanding and having the capability to react to what's going on and realizing the true impact on your business. So when zero clients were not only able to understand their volumes, their risk and PL impact from this event. But even one step further, they're, they're able to dive right into how did the characteristics of my flow change? We've introduced concepts like markouts and decay analysis in real time to our clients that they're able to look right away and react and say, as Duncan noted, the, the, the nature and characteristics of my flow are different. And, and that can drive quick decision making around liquidity demands. You know, Harple noted. We've been building knobs and dials for, for over a decade here. And, and there are certain situations where if you have 24 hours to react to something, a, a series of knobs and dials is effective. We've been taking that one step further in, in taking the investment that we've made in data and stepping one step forward into automated and data-driven decision-making, helping brokers detect and analyze when a vol regime change is occurring or characteristics of their markouts or decay are happening in real time and allowing them to, to drive the system or allow the system to drive itself. And I think that will be a really interesting continued evolution and, and innovative approach now that we have this new very interesting data set. You know, every time one of these events happens, SMB, uh, the, the volatility coming out of COVID, any flash crash, you you're first look to make sure everything held up fine. And then you look to that data set to say, how do my models, how do the way that, that I have tuned and automated the way that my business reacts in real time? And, and how can I continue to make that better? And that that's one of those really defining industry components that that I'm happy to say we were we were well ahead of. Um, the other side of it, and and probably a good transition, so I'm not monopolizing the uh, conversation point, but multi-asset. I think multi-asset really got, got 
yeah. uh, the limelight over the past few months, seeing the drive of interest into less speculative and more investment-based trading and exchange-driven markets. And I think the brokers who had those capabilities have done quite well in picking up the surge in, in account opening. Okay, Brendan, I haven't heard from you for a while. Your post-COVID-19 landscape. And bear in mind, I mean, like uh, we didn't say, say it to Andy, but I see, um, we all see the dark clouds uh, ominously looming of recession. Uh, global recession looming darker and darker. Um, how does it, how do you factor that in, Brendan? Uh, for, so for us, global recession will, will still mean quite a bit of volatility. I imagine volatility is around for the rest of the year. It'll probably bounce. You know, I think we've got devastating second quarter earnings releases coming up, so it'll it'll be in the share based products. You know, during that window, and then it may bounce into oil again, and may, you know. I think, I think volatility is here to stay, and that's the, that's the good news for people in our line of work, great transactional-based financial services businesses. As far as what's ahead for us, it's, it's more, better, faster. It's not, it's not necessarily a change in our outlook or strategy by any means. You don't get a ton of credit for maintaining during times like this. That's expected. You still have yeah. to be innovating. And, and during the pandemic, we've, we've launched. We've launched commission-free share CFDs. We've launched uh, new stock baskets like eSports and the Cannabis One and quite a few others. We launched an integration with TradingView, which is one of the top research and trading tool providers in our, in our space. Um, what's next on the list is largely client determined. So we, are, we meticulously curate feedback we're getting from our clients. There's a shift report that the shift manager does three times a day that goes all the way up to the executive team. And, and we kind of track there what we need to be focused on. Uh, so for us, like Andrew said, multi-product, we, we, are, we, are, we continue to enhance our product offering because we wanna have the products um, that are moving when, when that volatility does bounce around. Uh, we, we've always prided ourselves on connectivity. So we've got some of the most reliable uh, and, and um, usable APIs in the business. And uh, I think Andrew was mentioning a lot, a lot more is data driven going forward. We're seeing in the retail space, a lot more quant based trading and algorithms. Um, and we want to facilitate to that. We want to be known as an, as an algorithm trader hub. Um, okay. So we've got a lot of educational tools. We've got a lot of resources and we've got um, a great suite of APIs that allow for uh, all the automated strategies you could want for. And we're not typically, um, what in the UK is referred to as a B-book shop. We externalize a great deal of our flow on an STP basis. So we love algorithmic flow. A lot of our competitors turn it off and dissuade it, um, but that's right up our alley. Our systems are built to handle uh, ST, STP flow, even with bad attributions or what others might call toxic. Um, that's all good by FXM. Okay, and Duncan, you, your post COVID-19 landscape. Uh, yeah, I, I, actually I would just, uh... Uh, you know, second, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that Brendan said, actually, um, there's no real change per se. We, uh, you know, we continue to push out education, good spreads, um, uh, 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 easy to use platform. Um, but what I would say is, is, is that it's really important that, uh, you know, firms uh, look to diversify their product range. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think everyone is, is geared up or it's going to become more geared up towards um, different asset classes. Uh, Why do you I mean, with banks, I... Sorry, well, no, with no, banks, no. Uh, banks printing money, um, you know, the client's going to be sort of almost obligated to invest a, a, and look for a turn, you know, that is, uh, that's not inflation linked. Um, so, uh, it, like I said, it's going to be a tough, risky environment, but, you know, with the right education, with the right suite of products, um clients definitely will have a uh, the potential to 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 utilize the platforms that we're giving them in order to enhance their investor process okay mark yeah mark, i think uh, post covid 19 it's um uh, I think uh, to pick up what Andrew said on, uh, on data-driven decisions, uh, I think that is for sure key and uh, has been driving a lot of the development work on our side for the past uh, couple of years. But I think what is even more important is also to have, uh, you could say, actionable uh, technology and flexible technology to actually action that 
data, right? Whatever that tells you. And I think um, I think we also a bit a few surprises with the you could say the gold liquidity, uh, but especially with the oil trading at negative prices uh, a month ago, whatever it was, mm-hmm. uh, posted a number of challenges from a technological point of view, right? Uh, but so so I think there's going to be uh, or at least a lot of focus on our side is on risk management uh, post COVID-19 when it comes to especially commodities and single stocks, because we do see things that we've never seen before or even anticipated when we built the system. Uh, okay. so, um, so I think an in, in enhanced focus on risk management, uh, trust, uh, stress test scenarios, uh, test client portfolios, counterparty risk. I think volatility, uh, you're always, uh, at least from an STP point of view as a, as a, as a prime broker, you, you're concerned about counterparty risk. Uh, so uh, you need the right risk management tools in place to, uh, to mitigate or minimize some of that. Uh, and I think that falls back on, on what has been a theme for a long time since SMB, which is balance sheet. Uh, I think there will be a, a focus on balance sheet going forward. Uh, I don't think they ever, I, didn't, I don't think it went away, but I think times like this remind us of counterparty risk uh, and, and balance sheet. So, um, okay, thank you. And Harpal, same to you, your, your post COVID 19 landscape. <laughs> You know, I think one of the things that's taught uh, a lot of us is that um, the world around us is uncertain. Uh, you know, things can happen. Nobody would have predicted, predicted you know, uh, an obvious single black swan, potentially multiple black swan events now. Um, so one thing we've really focused on is, is working together with our clients to fundamentally change their cost structures. Because we think if you can change someone's, if you can change your own cost structure uh, by, by a significant uh, amount, it gives you the flexibility to just have greater margin for error. So one of the things we've done, and in fact, we went, we've accomplished quite a lot of this uh, during, during the lockdown. I don't know if you recall, but late last year, we announced a new product in partnership with uh, Jefferies FXPB and with a number of leading market makers called TrueFX. And the idea behind it was to significantly bring down the cost of uh, FX trading. So access to technology, access to liquidity, and access to credit. And uh, we were pretty excited that the initial results turned out quite, quite nicely, that we were able to bring down costs for most brokers by anywhere between 75 and 80% uh, from their current cost structure of using uh, tier one bank PBs uh, and so on. So the interesting thing is we actually announced it in November uh, we we uh, signed up uh, a number of customers in December and January, and we actually went live with the system and did our first live trades during lockdown. Uh, so again, it just showed the resiliency of multiple parties coordinating themselves to do the first live trading with all the you know uh, post trade uh, STP infrastructure being done for the first time, brand new pipes being placed into a lot of places. Uh, and in fact, we're now onboarding customers on a, on a weekly basis. The other interesting thing that we've done with it, and you know, in fact, Brendan's team over at FXCM is, uh, has really uh, embraced this to support their customers, uh, is <clears throat> we're now allowing smaller brokers uh, who might not have the capacity to open up a credit relationship with Jeffrey's PB directly to actually set up credit relationships with existing brokers uh, who are larger than themselves in the market, for example, FXCM, uh, as a, a, a sponsored access point uh, to use all of this infrastructure. So when you combine you know, really low cost of credit, access to all the liquidity in the market, and from Integral's perspective, we've essentially contributed the technology for free use uh, to, to all of the broker community. Uh, it's just radically changing their cost structure. And I think that is giving them sort of the optionality to look at businesses uh, with a much lower risk footprint as to what investments they need to make uh, to be successful in there. So that's, uh, we think it's going to be quite traumatic going forward. Thank you. Interesting. Neither of you, neither of you mentioned uh, regulation in terms of whether that will be affected or whether there'll be changes coming up there. I mean, one of the most um, read articles of this year at Finance Magnus was comparing, well, discussing whether to see the FCA would follow the UKGC, the UK Gambling Commission, in protecting their, uh, you know, protecting gamblers during a lockdown period. Is this something that um, the tide, the, ten, the tide against gambling in Europe, certainly in UK, Sweden, do you think this is something that's going to uh, affect traders? 
as far as right. further regulations coming out from the FCA and ASIC? Well, more in the sense that, I mean, looking at the, uh, looking at the UK GC, the UK Gambling Commission, and there's been, we'll say, one of, one of our most read articles was, will the FCA start following the UK GC? And there's rumblings of it within the UK. And what's your opinion on it, whether there will? We, we've had a, quite a lot of direct interaction with FCA and ASIC, not ESMA directly so much, but it, in all three cases, I've never gotten a sense that they lump us into the same category as, uh, as gambling houses and betting shops. Um, I think the UK is pretty well situated with the regs that they put out a couple of years ago. I, I, we've not seen any proposal for new uh, rules, restrictions to the end client. FXCM is happy with what they've done. You know, I, Leverage restrictions are necessary. We can all argue about what the right level is, but you know, yeah. every regulator should have some minimum margin requirement in place for, um, to suit their own agenda. I mean, not to suit their own agenda, but to deliver on their own uh, program. They have to yeah. look out for the client's best interests and they shouldn't in that regard, rely wholly on industry to do it uh, by itself. A ASIC obviously is going to be coming out with rules. We're in line with, again, we can argue the semantics and the exact leverage requirement details, but we're certainly supportive of the efforts that they're making there. I I've never gotten a sense that they, they are going to be putting further restrictions on or, or, or again, lumping us with betting houses and gambling shops. So I, I don't anticipate anything there. There has been restrictions on credit card funding yeah. in the U.S. That may come about in other jurisdictions. And if it does, it's, it's kind of a so be it for us. Believe it or not, it would probably more than probably, it would reduce our um, transaction uh, fees. We, we, we pay the credit card transaction fees on behalf of our clients when they deposit using one. So it's okay if they go that route, we wouldn't disagree. Our, our customer due diligence requires us to, to verify that the customer isn't funding with, with credit money, with, but risk capital. Um, so it wouldn't be a change to our business model or really our, our performance, I, I don't anticipate. Um, okay. I, know, I know some of our, competitors have noticed an uptick now that sports are down all over the world they're seeing more people bet in the financial markets I, I wouldn't I wouldn't correlate any of what we've seen to that you know volatility is the big tailwind that we've all experienced you know and I, I haven't seen anything that's led me to believe it's more than that as far as any uptick in uh, volumes and, and revenue okay Duncan same to you can you uh, see the uh, the FX industry being swept up you know in the tide against uh, the gambling I, I, I would always strongly argue that they're, they're two distinct, distinctly different environments and one shouldn't get confused between the two. Um, what I would say though is, is that the regulations that have been imposed on uh, the retail environment for uh, FX CFDs um, mm -hmm that includes negative balances actually has 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 actually sort of almost gamified the concept of uh trading yeah and that's very very dangerous i think especially when you consider how close cfd's fx margin trading is to trading uh future or an option for instance so i think it's it it's it's a dangerous precedent actually that the uh, regulators have actually set in 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 this particular uh, aspect, because it, it gives a sort of sense of security to uh, a a product that really carries risk. Then uh, Harpel, <clears throat> you know we. Uh, we don't have a strong view on uh, and, and don't really take a position on um, uh, whether trading is based on speculation or risk transference. Um, what I can say is that we've seen these trends in other markets that have been uh, involved in them longer uh, than, than others. And they tend to follow uh, similar arcs of sort of maturity. And that is, is that, uh, you know, they, they start off unregulated. Uh, they have very, very high leverage ratios. Uh, there's, um, um, you know, there's some abuse in the markets. Uh, regulators come in. They generally turn the dial related to leverage ratios. And generally speaking, um, uh, brokers respond by significantly improving and scaling 
the quality of their of their platforms. Uh, and it goes through these sort of ebbs and flows and eventually gets to a point of, uh, of equilibrium uh, or, or one level. But again, I would just uh, uh, remind everyone to just look at the Japanese market. I mean, the Japanese market has been uh, uh, sort of uh, perennially five to six years ahead of every other market. And um, every single time there is a change or there's some speculation on the regulatory side, whether it's Australia or now, uh, you know, in the UK, uh, you know, people think it's, it's doom and gloom and so on. But, you know, the Japanese market has had very, very tight regulations. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, the same thing has followed in the crypto market. They were, they were ahead in the crypto market, and now you're starting to see volumes uh, in the crypto space within Japan do similar types of things as in the FX space uh, in Japan, where they dwarf the rest of the world. Uh, they have incredibly tight spreads. Uh, they have highly, highly scalable systems. And, uh, you know, those brokers there, in essence, are internet companies. Um, they, are, they are pure, 100% hardcore technology companies, including Yahoo uh, in Japan and various other players. So if you want to look at where we'll be three, four years from now, um, I suspect uh, a lot of the folks that are offering uh, products to end customers, brokers, will scale to be very, very large, sophisticated uh, providers of technology. Okay, excellent. I know we're running short of time, so Mark and Angel, I wanted to ask you, uh, start with you guys, start with you, Mark, last question. Where is the alpha in today? Where is it? Is it new investors, market entrants, veterans, more sophisticated traders? Where's the alpha? Um, it's a good question. Well, I think in today's alpha, it, it, if you look at it from a retail point of view, uh, I guess it depends where you sit, whether you take retail or B2B, right? But if you look at it from a, from a, from a retail point of view, it's probably online marketing, right? Uh, what we have seen uh, from uh, on our clients, the people that have actually nailed online marketing and 100% automated uh, sales funnels uh, are also the guys that are striving. Uh, they are uh, turning into the biggest brokers uh, globally. Uh, and then you could argue Corona uh, is probably only going to accelerate that, right? Uh, the whole uh, old way of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, selling and IPs and, and all that stuff it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not no longer relevant. It's, so I think it's, uh, it must be online marketing. And uh, I'm surprised, Brendan, on the, on the retail side, uh, not that we have retail, but just speaking to, to, to partners, uh, there seems to be a big uptick in new accounts coming in uh, from people sitting at home. Uh, general public have nothing to do. They see in the news, uh, stock markets are crashing, all crash, they all want part of it, right? And, uh, and, as, and, uh, and uh, as someone said, they can't gamble, there are no sports. Uh, so, uh, so they want to have a, a bit on um, on uh, on stocks or whatever. Uh, so, uh, but it's all online. Uh, so, I guess that will be the alpha. And that's what I mean. You said, it goes back to the previous point about the, whether there there will be a tide against uh, trading from people that's you know are against the gambling and the nanny state and the UK GC. And you know, uh, we saw it was saw, saw it as well. There was a big drop in sports betting. There was a big drop, and there were there were surveys from people saying well we went on the stock market we, you know we try we for the first ever time we had a bit of a, we we sit at home we, we stuck a thousand pound in this and everything else that and there's a big oh, sorry yeah but but i think just back to uh, to uh, to to the previous question um uh, and and what you mentioned there i think it's important and i hope the regulators they they uh, recognize the difference between gambling and uh, and trading or investing uh, because gambling per design uh, is designed for people to lose money uh, or for the house to always win, right? Uh, pretty much. Where financial markets are not designed for clients to lose. Uh, so I think there's an important difference there that I hope the regulators, they, they recognize when they go in and, and don't apply a similar mindset on financial services as they do on, on gambling. Because it is yeah. two distinct, uh, you could say, services from a, from a design point of view. Okay, okay. thank you. And Andrew? Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback right on that because I, I think about it very similar to, to how Mark just outlined the go forward challenge for, for, for retail brokers specifically. And that's, yeah. we spent the last two or three years uh, spending a lot of time thinking about regulation, evolution, which is natural and, and constant and perpetual. We spent a lot of time talking about whether or not crypto was going to replace fiat. And during this period, the what, what we didn't find in the commonality between these threads that we're, we're linking to the retail brokerage market is the onboarding experience. 
finance. The, 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 the bro brokers like Robinhood that are starting up in the US, uh, Revolut and, and, and all of the crypto franchises are attracting the mass of, of millennial speculators, investors, funds, et cetera. And we're putting our attention on regulation or, or the asset class. And we're not stepping back and saying, you know, in, in one of the most highly regulated uh, environments that exist across the globe, the US equities market, Robinhood was able to come with a retail offering. You can open an account in 12 clicks. You can fund it with a bank account. So all of these have nothing to do with credit cards or regulation, et cetera. They spent their time and focus innovating the onboarding and client experience, which is truly the differentiating factor, in, in my opinion, for a retail brokerage offering. And, and the, the partners that we've had, and, and, and we're, we're servicing close to 200 entities between retail brokerages, wholesale, banks and hedge funds around the world, the entities that have succeeded the most, especially in the retail market, are those who have embraced the fact that their onboarding and client portal and engagement experience for opening funding and engaging accounts with clients is the deterministic factor to their success. And, and they've looked at technology, risk management, et cetera, which is a fundamentally different business process to manage and made the decision to rely on a partner like One Zero for, for doing that. And, and from my perspective, a continued focus on the onboarding experience client portal as the defining aspect and competitive aspect to push away these new asset entrants, these new market entrants to retail brokerage and continue to stake our claim on, on presenting financial markets of beyond just FX, equities, crypto, futures, all in one basket and, and allow clients to fund and engage that product in a way that's uh, quick and seamless and, and allows them to start trading as soon as possible is, is the success criteria. And, and on the back end, how you risk manage, how you access liquidity, relying on a partner for that is, is the defining way to go about your uh, achievement of that success because it's very difficult to do both in one firm. Is it a generational thing? Oh, 100%. So, I, yeah. I think it, it, similar to the regulation conversation, I, 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 don't, I don't think a dissertation needs to be done that, that, that the aging and, and, and focused demographic of investment and trading is evolving constantly over time. And as, as millennials are getting into a position where they have assets to either invest or speculate on, they're looking for platforms and brokerage experiences all the way from how they're marketed to, to how they open their account, to how they engage from a customer support <laughs> perspective. And that paradigm is going to constantly evolve. So if you're complacent in your approach to servicing your clients and focusing too much on developing or owning all aspects of your business, you're going to fall behind on the, on the critical component that the, the new entrants to the market, especially the crypto brokers and likes of these, these startup, smaller app-driven equities firms are vacuuming up the opportunity that's coming as a result of that perpetual evolution in the target client demographic. You know, you know, I'd like to, I, I'd like to just uh, clarify something on there. I, I think that analysis was was a little bit unfair uh, in two aspects. Number one, uh, Robinhood's disruptive innovation wasn't just the user experience piece. And in fact, although the user experience is good, it's not that different than any modern uh, UI. The difference was they entered a no fee. They entered the U.S. equity market not just as a discount broker, but a free broker, and they were the first ones to do that. In fact, it was that innovation that has led to the vast amount of disruption in the U.S. equity broker market, which is why you're seeing all these mergers and now nobody's charging fees. I think in contrast to that, uh, uh, FX brokers over the last 15 to 20 years have been some of the most innovative uh, shops in the world. Uh, and uh, the growth rates of FX brokers far outstripped what Charles Schwab and a number of other brokers were doing in the U.S. market. Having said that, CFDs are not legal in the U.S. So a lot of the innovation, a lot of the interesting things that are going on in Europe and in Japan and in Australia just aren't legal in the U.S. So the one last place that you could do it was in equities. Uh, so they introduced a product in equities where the user doesn't pay commissions. And uh, Virtue and Jump on the back end uh, are making markets and giving rebates, LP rebates, uh, back to the broker. So that was a pricing innovation. Which is a new uh, so, 
their business model as well. Sorry, their business model. I mean, it's uh, we don't know if they're making money. I mean, it's for an exit. And so how much has that affected you guys? I mean, their business model is unsustainable, surely. Well, I think just, just to get the opportunity to, to respond there, the, the innovation that I'm talking about wasn't in the platform. And, and <clears throat> I, I think in our industry, especially retail FX, front end platform innovation is, is a topic that we're all tired of talking about. And, and we've pretty much capitulated that the meta platform is there and, and is actually a, a very non-differentiating factor between a majority of the business that exists out there today. I think the onboarding experience was a key focus. And I think the point of looking to non-bank market makers for the sole point of P&L generation, building not a one size fits all pool of liquidity, which essentially is what an exchange is in itself, and outsourcing risk management and alpha generation while focusing on the client acquisition and onboarding experience is right in line with the point that I'm making. It's not about the platform. The platform is a couple charts and a buy and sell button. It's about the onboarding experience, the focus on marketing, having the attention to find that right demographic and area. I, I do agree with our Paul that equities was a vulnerable market in the US due to regulation and where it was. But because they weren't focusing on the back end and were able to outsource a lot of that to their non-bank partners, they, they were able to innovate on that acquisition sales and marketing point, which, which is really the driver behind my argument. While I agree with you, it has to be said, it's illegal for them to focus on <laughs> the market making and be a broker at the same time. You have to outsource that in the equity markets in the United States. So they didn't have a choice. So, I don't, so it's not fair to say that there was a conscious decision as part of their business model. Um, you either send it to an exchange or you send it to a market maker. You can't internalize it. You can't do that even in the FX markets unless you disclose that to customers. But be that as it may, I actually find a lot of innovation going on in the FX markets. I mean, I, I, in some ways, Robinhood took some of the ideas that really innovative, unregulated players uh, in, in a lot of these frontier markets started to do. And, and I'll raise another point about crypto. You know, you can look at, there's, there's two worlds in crypto. There are the regulated players, like the Coinbases of the world and so on, who, albeit used to have a high market cap, their volumes are de minimis relative to the unregulated exchanges like BitMEX and the various uh, unregulated derivatives uh, and uh, perpetual futures exchanges in crypto. And again, there is the case that, hey, they're unregulated. They're doing lots of things in terms of onboarding because they're just not following the AML, um, you know, KYC uh, requirements. So it's kind of unfair to look, you know, to give advice to uh, a group of, of, of regulated entities that are trying to work within um, the restrictions that are there and show examples of places who just don't play by the same rules. And sorry, Brendan, and, uh, Brendan, you're, um, where's, the, where's the alpha? Well, just, just on the Challenger Bank note, I think, I think these guys are facing the music now. I think Monzo is <laughs> facing a 40% down round. And, and that, that's significant because they're in a CD round, I think. And, and with covenants, it probably means the founders of the company have been liquidated Diluted the, common the, com the common equity is wiped out for those guys. Yeah. So, so that means they're, they're, they're more or less walking dead. If the owners don't own a significant stake in it anymore, I, would, I wouldn't be betting on for long. Anyway, as far as where Alpha is, I I'd reiterate some of what Mark said. I'm spending a lot of my time in the marketing department now. I, I think all of our marketing departments, um, you know, certainly ones that are addressing the retail market, have a lot more technicians in, in that function now than creatives like we had in the past. Um, if you, you've got to be immediate, like I said earlier, the volatility is going to move around for the rest of the year. One day it'll be in shares. One day it'll be in fixed income. The next it'll be in oil or commodities. And if TravelX gets hacked, you need to be updating your banner ads across the internet to say, come short TravelX restriction free here with us and, uh, and commission free. And here's our spreads on top of it. You, you need to be able to do that immediately. And the firms that, that do that better, quicker will, will, uh, perform better. So we're, we're doing a lot in, in the marketing department. Um, th this is all, to one of Andrew's points, this is all scientific, it's all data-driven. The, the, the research and the testing has to be done well in advance so that you can react in real time when there's news that would determine your marketing budget uh, should shift. It's, in most cases, marketing's are top or second top spend every month. So it's a, it's a big part of our, um, 
our effort and, and where we're, you know, money where your mouth is scenario. It's, it's a big part of what we do as a company. Duncan, for you, where's the alpha? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, the guys have actually said quite a, quite a lot of it. it, it um, it's engagement. It's service. I mean, as, an, as an example, we, um, we were opening an enormous amount of accounts uh, during, this, uh, during this COVID period. Uh, but an interesting point was that the client feedback was that, or specific area of the client feedback was saying that they were opening accounts on the basis that they were looking at, at a market that was in a free fall and they've got pensions and they wanted to hedge in some way their pension, which they've never been able to do before or hadn't, hadn't thought about before because markets have been going up for the last uh, 10 years. So it, it, for them, it was a wake up call and, and it wasn't just millennials. It was, it was actually further up the scale as well in terms of age. So from a marketing perspective, though, that is, that is something actually that it, it becomes actually a real, um, uh, a real environment to really, really get involved in because you just got to find these people who, who are looking for something and the business can help them. So from Tipmill's perspective, it was, um, it was enlightening, even though the product's been there for, for X amount of years. So it's, um, uh, and I, and I think also then you, you, you push that back into the company itself and it's, it's again, uh, looking at data and big data and using that to analyze exactly, uh, where, where we are, where we stand and where the potential is going forward. Okay. Mark, anything to add on that on the, where the alpha is? No, I think the guys, uh, I think the guys covered it and, uh, and I think we actually pretty much all agree on the, on the marketing side, on the marketing and the onboarding funnels. Uh, yeah are key on the client side, right? Whatever the platform is in the background, uh, we know what that's going to be, at least at the moment. So, um, yeah, no, I think it's covered. Brilliant. Well, we're getting, um, I think we're winding up. We're getting some questions coming in. So, we're getting some questions from the audience, if it's okay to ask. Uh, they have been vetted, I hope. Uh, so, one of them, in 2019, many brokers made the move to more unregulated jurisdiction. Do you foresee a sharper regulated or non-regulated div division? I'm, I'm happy to start there. I, I think <laughs> it's, it's important to bifurcate a bit. There's a difference between a firm that's headquartered in a non-regulated non or lightly regulated jurisdiction and a firm that has a sub-entity there but is regulated in one of the highest regulated industry or, or regions on the planet. Um, I, I, you know, regulators are taking the approach and not wrongly in a lot of places that they're there to, they're look out they're they're there to look out for and protect the citizens of that country that, you know, they're, they're, they're government agencies. So foreign clients can be a bit persona non grata in some of these, and some of them have overtly said so uh, in some of these entities. So companies that do have our headquartered location in, in London under, FCA license or an Australian or NASIC license. We do need offshore entities and FX team has one. We have an entity in Bermuda. Um, we don't disallow our clients from opening with any of the regulated entities, but in a lot of cases, they don't want to adhere to some of the restrictions um, of those entities that, uh, that they don't have to adhere to. They're, they're not in a region that would require it. Um, the, you know, the, the reason I emphasize this point is because when, when you're headquartered in, in a heavy heavily regulated jurisdictions, you have to jump through all those hoops. There's, yeah. You're not starting from the minimal and working up uh, from there. You're starting at the maximum and, and where you can make slight variances in local requirements, you do, but with all of the external sign off and, you know, legal opinions uh, in hand, it's, it's um, you know, I, I want to be careful about sounding hypocritical, but it's, uh, we, we, we wouldn't encourage someone to go with an offshore company that doesn't have an onshore heavily licensed, heavily regulated uh, headquartered entity behind it. Um, so th that's my two cents on it. Okay. How pal? You know, I, again, we're not a retail broker, but I can just tell you from what we're seeing uh, in, in customers. Uh, and uh, again, 
Uh, one example to maybe look at as, a, as analogous is what's happening in the crypto market. Uh, there essentially is an extreme bifurcation taking place between uh, regulated and unregulated entities. Uh, and on the regulated side, people choose it because their capital is safe, uh, is custodied uh, within a regulated entity and it's safe. Uh, there's less leverage, uh, there's less variety of, uh, of asset classes and, uh, and so on, but it's safe. Uh, in the unregulated entities, it's the Wild West and there's a huge amount of innovation, there's a huge amount of um, uh, um, interesting derivative products that are getting created. Uh, and there's a lot of abuse. Um, you know, <laughs> some of the volatility events that took place in March, people's accounts got wiped out uh, in practices that used to take place in the FX market 18 or 19 years ago uh, are taking place in the crypto market today. Uh, but I will tell you, customers like it. The volumes in the unregulated markets outstrip the regulated ones in crypto 20 to 1, 30 to 1. Uh, it's not even close. It's not like it's a 25 or 50 percent difference. So I don't know what happens in F. Excuse me? Sorry. Is that down to marketing? No, not in that case. It's, it's down to uh, functionality, access to leverage, uh, access to innovative uh, derivative products for uh, speculation on uh, interesting asset classes. Um, Easy onboarding. I, excuse me? Yeah, ease of onboarding. No KYC whatsoever. I mean, you can transfer BTC from a private wallet address into an account and start trading within, I don't know, 35 seconds. Uh, well, I, I should say five minutes, as long as it takes the blockchain to confirm the transfer. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, there are some customers who want to be, uh, you know, uh, are trading for entertainment as a positive word to spit on it, uh, to put on it rather than investment. And they will move to the place uh, that gives them the greatest entertainment value. Uh, and then there are others who are relatively more conservative and more interested in investment, and they will stay within the regulated uh, spaces. Um, I don't even think we'll necessarily call them FX brokers in the future. Okay. They're just intermediaries that are offering access to um, uh, to speculation. Uh, speculation with leverage through interesting UIs and experiences and so on. And it's all entertainment. Uh, it's gaming. Um, and it's a massive, massive industry. And I think it'll increase quite a lot uh, in this world of being at home because it's entertaining. <laughs> I think if I can add... Well, what, what will drive innovation out of that, and, and, and I agree with, with the points that are made about regulatory arbitrage, which, which was a brokerage-driven exercise for many years, I, I think the word that, that we're using or I'm thinking about for, for the innovation going forward is demystifying some of that both regulatory and derivative product kind of cloud. So uh, as Brendan noted, a broker should be allowed to present options to their client as long as it's clear and transparent the di risk decision they're making, just like when they enter the trade, of where they're deciding to sit their funds versus the experience that they're looking for. And I think transparency into that process for regulated and established entities is going to be important. And, and Harpal made a great point about derivatives. I think another area where we're going to see uh, necessitated differentiation and evolution over the next couple of years is demystifying derivative products, especially around commodities trading. We've seen the gold basis go upside down. We've seen oil on the front month go negative. negative. And that's led to a vastly different experience depending on how the spot product that you've decided to trade or a rolling future that's being offered by your broker reacted to some of those environments. And I think in addition to transparency of what it needs to trade in different regulatory areas, opening the, the, the curtain a little bit on how derivative products, especially based off of futures and commodities are constructed and educating clients around what they're actually trading is another aspect of almost regulatory decoupling or regulatory arbitrage break apart where you allow the client to make the decision just as you do the endpoint decision to place a trade on that instrument or not. Okay, excellent. Mark? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, it's a good point by, uh, by Andrew and, uh, and Brendan, and, but I think it is a requirement to have solid onshore presence as well by uh, ASIC, FCA, whatever, right? Because that gives credibility and, uh, and, and sort of means that, uh, that you're doing things by the book. Uh, if it's 100% offshore, who knows what's going on, right? I mean, there's no one policing it. There's no one protecting the, uh, the client. 
Um, so I think onshore pressing is key if you want to go down that route. Uh, we don't have anything offshore. Uh, but if you do want to go down the offshore route, uh, you need to have something onshore to, uh, to, uh, to, make, it, uh, to make it credible. Uh, and if you do go down that route, then make it transparent, as Andrew said, is key. Uh, what are the uh, risks involved? I think the demystifying derivative is a good word. Uh, there's probably a lot of confusion and how's the price created and all that stuff. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, onshore presence and, and transparency is key. Excellent. Duncan? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, at Tecmo, we've always looked at uh, strong regulation, uh, but it has to be tempered uh, to a certain degree with, you know, the sort of commercial aspects of the business. Uh, I, I think regulators, or certainly the SCA, have, uh, have um, you know, they, they want to look after both the clients, but also they have a, a, an obligation to look after the firms as well. So we have to have a, a, some sort of uh, equity uh, between client and firm. Um, I mean, if you think about it, overburden, overburden some regulation, it, it's, it's no good for clients either. Uh, hmm. And it leads to major cost increases. Um, I mean, one example of that is if you, if you look at the sort of whole transaction reporting element in, in the EU. Now, what happens in January should the UK actually leave? Um, I don't know, but it's uh, you know that's a, that's another topic, perhaps for another day. But it's uh, it's it, it, it's going to it, it could massively shift in favour of of the UK. And the way in which the uh, SCA and firms face uh, face the world. So, in, in one respect, it actually could be uh, enlightening and actually change the whole focus of uh, of the utilisation of uh, offshore entities, uh, oh, well, offshore offshore regulation. So that leads nicely into the the next question. Actually, we've got uh, somebody put in there. Give me something positive about 2020, 2020. After all the do, doom and gloom, something positive that's come out of the industry. Uh, I think that we're all still here. We're all still here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. all innovating. Finance Magnets is innovating. We're doing virtual conferences. Yes, um, I think those booths are actually pretty cool. We might meet more people in this conference online then we'd meet uh you know perhaps in person and it's a lot easier on my feet and on my uh <laughs> on my jet lag so all that's good uh so I, you know i think um people have really stepped up i mean uh, uh, uh market makers uh, uh brokers uh technology providers uh customers uh all came into this uh a little bit um uh dis you know disoriented and very quickly uh, got their balance, uh, figured out a new uh, set of priorities and responded to it. And so I think it creates opportunity for anyone who wants to step up and service the next level of the food chain that they support. Okay. Uh, and so I think the innovation is gonna be fantastic. I think people will have more options, lower costs, uh, and uh, you know, you're just shaking up the board a bit. And then there are lots of opportunities for aggressive, innovative, uh, hardworking firms um, to grow. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Not to mention the fact that the central banks have just liquefied the entire world. Uh, so we're all going to have fun things to look at for the next year. Yeah, on the, on the back of that, I was just going to say volatility. I think coming out of 2018 and 2019, um, over the holiday period, we all went to our respective homes and did a volatility rain dance and, and maybe we should coordinate those and stagger them a bit better uh, over the future because uh, instead of a trickle, we got a monsoon here with COVID, but we, we still have, we're out of the frying pan and into the fire with Brexit and Eurozone debt. We have an election year here in the US coming up. We have you know continued questions of, of liquidity and, and equities markets and, and where they've, uh, I'll say, corrected to in, in the state of play today. And, that should all drive to a, a topic of conversation that was paramount last year, which is where is the volatility coming from? And, you know, a poor driving factor to our businesses has certainly returned. And those of us who are rising to the occasion and, and able to innovate are doing so. And, and, and it's creating a really exciting environment that I think, uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll coordinate somehow virtually on staggering those rain dances in the future. So we get volatility more in uh, 
consistent. It's with term. clothes, Andrew. With clothes. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, Vol, Vol has been great. It's back and uh, exciting year for that, both looking forward and behind. Mark, something positive for, for 2020? Yeah, I would echo the guys. I mean, resilience. Uh, I think it's been fascinating to see uh, the people internally in, in CFH, but also partners on, on this call and, uh, and clients all coming together with one purpose uh, to get through this together, right? We all know this is temporary, but coming together like, uh, like a team coordinating with partners, tech providers, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been extremely fascinating and also revealed a lot of efficiencies uh, all of a sudden, right? That, that, that we are now uh, taking advantage on. Uh, Taking Zoom calls like this uh, with uh, people in the US, Asia, all in one day, uh, I think it was happening before, but it's happening a lot more now, right? And, and I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's been extremely fascinating. And I would echo what Andrew said on the volatility side. Uh, it's, it's definitely here to stay. Uh, it's taking a bit of a uh, slowdown at the moment, but uh, uh, it's going to happen over the summer, election, uh, and so forth. It's, um, it's here to stay, so uh, watch out. Watch out for the US election. That as well. <laughs> yeah. Brendan? Yeah, a, a badge of honor has been earned here. There's been a common enemy, and uh, the team at FXCM's um, drawn more closely together. It's uh, our, our client service levels stayed the same, more in, in some metrics improved during the pandemic. We've, we've innovated and launched new products and offerings, um, which is something everyone will and, and certainly should take pride in for quite a long time to come. So we're rocking and rolling and we've got a big agenda for the rest of the year too. So, I, you know, it's, it's been a challenge, you know, and I, I think people are stir crazy and ready to get out of their houses. And it's good to see that that, that, that is coming. And in some regions is, is more or less here. Um, you know, but I think you know, I certainly speak for the team at FXCM. We're, we're proud of what was done during these past few months and we're proud of how we stood by our clients and made sure that they were the, the focus of every decision uh, and every resource allocation, you know, that, that we did in the, in the process. And uh, we'll carry a lot of pride forward from here. Nice. Gents, anything else for 2020? No, nothing more positive. <laughs> yeah. We got through it. We got our health. Business is still intact. We'll take that. Less, less plastic, less smog. And we can start talking about Brexit again. <laughs> in a positive light? No? Challenging positive. That's for the next webinar. Yeah. Leaders insight on Brexit. Right, gents, thank you so much. That's where we're wrapping up now. We can get in the, uh, the signal. It really has been a fascinating and insightful uh, event. I really do appreciate your time. I'm sure the audience really do appreciate the insight uh, and the commentary. Thank you so much. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. The details will be for this recording will be uh, available afterwards. Uh, and thank you very much for attending the Virtual Vision Finance Leaders Roundtable. An insight for New Year. Thank Thanks, you, gents. For sure. Thank, thank you, Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, guys.